Good morning, everybody, on a rainy afternoon in Southern California. We join you with the Tilted Lawyer podcast to discuss everything that's going on with Gypsy Rose and her very tragic awakening that led to the death of her mother and that led to her being confined for seven years in a state correctional facility that led to a life sentence of her autistic boyfriend. And she's talked a lot about it since she's gotten released. And we're going to dive in as I share with you my candid thoughts on the Gypsy Rose case. Let's get started. Whatever you might be going through and wherever you might be, this is Omar Serrano with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast. I'm here to take your mind off of things. Yes, I'm an attorney. No, I'm not giving you legal advice. I'm going to sit and talk like people as these are the candid thoughts of one practicing attorney and it's after hours so have a seat feel free to have a drink and join me let's get started let's rock and roll so gypsy rose i don't know dominic producer dominic how much you remember about this case when she had first come out but she first hit the radar like in 2005 and in 2005 what how old were you you were you must have been like a baby you were like what seven i was six jesus christ i was your age <laughs> in, in 2005 i was uh not quite on the lawyer path i was trying to do i forget what i was trying to do real estate or something i was trying to get my real estate license and she was on the news but in not a sinister way it was oh we're relocating this family from the the damaged whatever Katrina did to their home, they got a brand new home, and we learned about Dee Dee Blanchard, her mom, and we learned about Gypsy Rose and everything that she had gone through, and all of her ailments, and she was in a wheelchair, and all of these things. And fast forward ten years into the future, when Gypsy was nineteen years old, you know, we just talked about Natalia Grace and how she was reaged to be 14 years older than what she was. Gypsy was re-aged. She had three separate birth certificates because her mom wanted her to remain basically a child and she trapped her in. Um, it was one of the most severe cases of Munchausen by proxy that this world has ever seen, at least to the degree that it's been covered in, in, in the Gypsy Rose case. And so, there's been a lot that's come out and there's a lot of documentaries out there. There's a lot of information out there. And before I really dive in, because I certainly have thoughts on the trial. I have thoughts on uh, the sentencing. I have thoughts on Gypsy Rose and her. Ultimately, she pled guilty to second degree murder. I have thoughts about the abuse that she underwent. And specifically, I think that this case really calls into question Autism, because if you're familiar with the trial, if you're familiar with the case at all, it came out during uh, the trial, the murder trial, that her boyfriend, uh, Godijan, was, I don't know if he was severely autistic, but he was certainly on the spectrum. He was listed as being high functioning, but with a low mental capacity. He was attacked in the media because during the trial, he was very unresponsive emotionally to a lot of the things that were going on. He's been accused of murder. He was going, they were going through the gory details of the murder and he kind of just sat there looking through everybody, the thousand yard stare, as you recall. When uh, Gypsy Rose came in to testify, she's giving her testimony and he's just kind of staring at her and people didn't really know how to interpret that. But one of the hallmarks of autism is that you lack an emotional effect to varying degrees, of course, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that he doesn't feel or experience emotions the same way that somebody that's not on the spectrum would. It just means that his emotional affects are not going to be as pronounced or obvious. And so he's been vilified and he's been shown sympathy. And this is one of these rare, these rare cases where, honestly, you could probably make a movie or a documentary about any of the key players that was involved, specifically Gypsy, of course, but her mom, Dee Dee Blanchard who may or may not have been a victim of Munchausen by proxy by her own mother. 
by Gypsy's boyfriend, Goda John, who was autistic and severely manipulated, seemingly, by Gypsy into discarding of her mom because she was abused uh, so severely. And I think the prosecution gave her a lot of leeway in allowing her to plead to second degree murder. And just to give you an idea, so if you're if you're convicted of second degree murder in that state, maximum sentence, of course, is life in prison, but the minimum is 10 years in prison. And when Gypsy took that plea, she was basically pleading to the minimum sentence that you could possibly get for a second degree murder charge. And she only did about seven years of that sentence. She was just released recently. There, there was a whole documentary about her account of everything and all of the abuses and the horrors that she went through. She had plenty to say about her mom. Uh, she had plenty to say about her boyfriend. And as I'm looking at this case, it, it's it's difficult to resolve yourself that this little girl, because when you see her growing up, we saw her growing up, she was in a wheelchair and she was the skinny, sickly little person. And her mom said that she had leukemia. She had seizure disorder. She had all of these different ailments. And... That's how we knew her. And it was such a shock to the people that knew her the best, family, friends, when they saw video of her appearing in court and she's walking around like a normal person. That was the biggest shocker to everybody at the time. It was like, you mean she could walk? This whole time she's been in a wheelchair and, and you know, all of a sudden she's in there walking uh, just like any normal adult would. And it shocked the national conscience because our introduction to Gypsy and to Dee Dee, her mom. I mean, they would literally go on stage and have these huge productions and, you know, news numbers about how the Gypsy is getting along and how her mom is struggling and helping her give her this, this as much of a normal life as she can. And she has leukemia and she has all these other ailments, but, you know, we're trying to make the best of it. And the donations and, and the support and the love and the, the adulation and the attention would pour in, which it turns out one of the hallmarks of, or, or one of the symptoms or one of the reasons why people fall into this Munchausen by proxy thing is basically they crave the attention. And it starts off really early where it, it usually... If you've researched it on, I've had somebody on uh, the show, I don't know how far back, uh, Judy Tienkin, she came in, she was a victim of Munchausen by proxy, and she came in and talked about all about the horrors that she would experience and some of the things that she went through. But it, it starts off innocently, like you go to the doctors, and in, in Gypsy's condition, she had a specific um, condition with her eyes, where if it wasn't corrected, she was inevitably going to be blind. She had a lazy eye. And they diagnosed that very quickly. She went to the doctors um, and it was a correct diagnosis. She got treated for it and it was fixed. It was corrected. But in the course of doing that, Dee Dee, she was hit with some kind of a dopamine release. The attention she got from the doctors, the attention she got from the family members, the attention she got from friends and family, all of that served a purpose for her. So I don't know what your opinion is of Dee Dee. She's been vilified, you know, by base from every corner of the universe, pretty much. But when I'm looking at this and I look at her origin story and I see where she kind of came from and in some of her background, you get the sense of kind of how that happened. So Dee Dee Blanchard, Dominic, I don't, I don't recall. What was she like five foot one, five foot two or something like that? Yeah, around there. Yeah, she was, she was short. She was heavy set, but she wasn't always heavy set. I mean, she was, you know, obviously when she was younger, she was, you know, a regular looking person. She wasn't exceptionally unattractive or attractive. She was just living her life. And, you know, she had family members that were living normal lives. But by all accounts from her family, she was babied by her mom. She was treated I don't want to go so far as to say that her mom would perpetrate illnesses on Dee Dee, but everybody basically says that Dee Dee kind of was doted on by her mom to the extent where it was this abnormal level of attention, of affection that she experienced when she was younger. 
And then at some point her mom passes away. When she's trying to put together the pieces, she meets up with Gypsy's dad, ultimately with who she would end up marrying. And if you hear him tell it, if you hear him tell it, he was like 17 years old at the time. And I think that she was 23 or, or 22, but she told him he, she was 21. But they started dating and very quickly, just things progressed very rapidly. Within a few months, she was already pregnant with Gypsy. And so this young man, being a, a man of, of a duty, perhaps some, some uh, measure of morality, decided that he was going to marry Dee Dee, and they did. And ultimately, after like a year or two, it was just like, I just, you know, you're cool and all, but I don't really love you like that. And basically rejected Dee Dee as a wife, and, you know, they got divorced, and that was kind of the end of that. And what was Dee Dee left with? She doesn't have her mom anymore. Her friends and family kind of look at her. I get the sense that, not that she's like the black sheep of the family, but just that she's in this special category in that family dynamic that not everybody else got the benefit of. And she had this baby, Gypsy who was, you know, this adorable looking kid. She had this eye condition and she got it fixed. And then she uh, takes her to the doctors and they go and they work on her and she gets a lot of attention and adulation that she used to get from her mom, that she had expected to get from her husband, but that was just simply absent going forward. And her only access to that really was Gypsy. And so even if, and let's just get this straight. What Dee Dee did to Gypsy is by far and away one of the worst accounts of child abuse that you could ever imagine that didn't result in death. And I mean, I've seen worse. I've seen children that were tortured. If you could imagine it, you know, I've, I've seen that. But in terms of what she did to Gypsy, perpetrating these illnesses on her, forcing her to be in a wheelchair. I think it was like when she was three or four years old and convincing her that she had cancer. She would literally tell Gypsy that, hey, I mean, your life expectancy, you're not expected to live past seven years old. And so you might as well just make the best of the time you have. And then it kept, according to Gypsy, extending to 15 to 21 to whatever, because while well, she would surpass those milestones. She literally had a feeding tube stuck in this little girl. And gosh, the way that you, the way that Gypsy looks right now, the way that she looks right now, she looks like a healthy young woman. If you look at the genetic makeup of Dee Dee, I mean, she's a heavy set lady. She puts on weight. She's healthy or she looked healthy. She didn't appear like she was grotesquely overweight. She was just, you know, she, she put on a lot of weight. She was strong. She looked like a healthy lady but gypsy when you see her in all of the pictures in her childhood really until these most recent interviews uh, that she's did with a lifetime is part of her most recent uh, documentary um she just looks like this sickly little person and the only reason that, that would have happened is if she's being malnourished if she's being forced to take medications that she doesn't need if she's being forced into treatment regimens that uh, don't belong to her, you know? And I don't know, maybe she would have had measures on being a gymnast. Maybe she could have been like an, a softball player at a collegiate level or professional. Uh, maybe she could have done anything, but whatever her physical proclivities were ultimately stunted by her mom. And if you are a young person, and I just remember there's one story that kind of stuck with me when I was doing my research into this case where Gypsy was a normal child, and I think that she had gotten into a motor, a minor motorci motorcycle accident with her grandfather, and she scraped her knee or something like that. And then Dee Dee turns around and bandages her up, and then she, you know, forces her into this cast or whatever. And then a short time later, all of a sudden, oh, here's a wheelchair, and you're going to be using this wheelchair. And she was this domineering figure over Gypsy. And she wasn't allowed to, to, to walk around on her own. Of course, when Dee Dee would leave, Gypsy would be a normal child. 
matter of fact, when she was staying with family, there's one of these stories where she's sitting there literally on a trampoline and she's having fun jumping around like every other kid and the family, you know, thinks nothing of it. Like, but Dee Dee says, oh, she's sick and she can't walk. She looks normal. And then as soon as Dee Dee pulls up, you know, she just basically flops down like a, fi a fish and Dee Dee freaks out. Like, don't you know that my daughter is crippled? And then they're looking at her like, what do you mean? She didn't look crippled to me. She was doing just fine. And that starts from a very early age, four or five years old, six years old. And I don't know, imagine going back to when you were four or five or six, you're nothing but energy and you want to play and you want to just do things. You want to go outside. If there's a trampoline, you know, I'm 43 years old. I'll tell you what, for, I think Olivia's third birthday party, I brought one of those bouncers to the house and put it in the backyard and took the kids in there and started jumping around. And I just remember after like 30 seconds, it was like this, this is not for a, a 42 year old man or however I was old at the time. Like I had a headache, my knees hurt. I got tired, you know, it was just not, I was not about it, but the girls, oh, they had so much fun. They wanted to live in there. They wanted to sleep in there. They would literally want to like bounce around and then lay down, roll around, just endless energy. And I remember those bouncers when I was younger, I would do the same thing for hours. You know, we're playing WWF, we're playing wrestling, clotheslines, jumping off the top rope, you know, somersaults all day, all day. And so Gypsy's over here and she is forced into basically being a crippled child for no good reason other than Dee Dee wanted it to happen. And I don't know what kind of mindset you would have to have. Dominic, you don't have children, right? No, I do not. If you had a child, if you had a child, I don't know, like under what circumstance would you decide that, hey, we're just, I'm going to stick you in a wheelchair and we're going to pretend like you're sick and I'm going to take care of you all of this time and you're not going to do anything and we're going to go to all these doctor's visits. First of all, for me as a dad, that sounds like a lot of work. I hate going to the doctors. But when you have your child, I mean, I have personally all these aspirations, even my younger, my eldest, Raven, played soccer all throughout her childhood. She's 17 years old now. She's retired. She decided she retired. Uh, she played softball. She played, I think she tried to play uh, basketball once. I, I took her to uh, the gym with me uh, to learn how to, uh, to box. And she tried to do that. And that didn't last but a day. But, you know, we're doing all these different things. I took her, I would take her to the batting cage and would be in the cages until her hands would literally bleed. Um, and even then she's like, dad, I didn't hear no bell. Or she didn't say that, but she said something like that. We watched the Rocky movie. She was in a quitter. And uh, she just wanted to keep going. And as a parent, I couldn't imagine not wanting to foster that energy and have it grow and just watch them grow and ascend. And so I guess my question to you, Dominic, is if you were to have a son, do you have aspirations of having children? Yeah. And when you have that child, what's one of the first things that you could think of that you want? Let's say you had a boy. What's one of the first things you could imagine doing with your imaginary son? I'm definitely playing catch baseball. <clears throat> yeah, that's like a staple, a hallmark, going outside doing physical things. But you know, your mind never goes to your children being sickly. And so what mindset that required from Dee Dee to go to that place is completely narcissistic on her part. And I remember when we talked to Judy Tienkin, and if you haven't seen uh, that show, I think we did it like four or five, maybe six months ago. She came in, well, she didn't come in. She was on the phone. We interviewed her. And she said that one of the things that her mom 100% was, was she was 100% narcissistic and everything was uh, to be driven by her narrative. And when the doctors would disagree with whatever it was, then, you know, she would go to a different doctor. And that's pretty much how Gypsy was treated. And that's how What's her name? Dee Dee would, when she would take her to the doctors, if she didn't hear what she wanted to hear from the doctor, she would say, all right, we're going to go to a different doctor. And then the whole Katrina incident gave her some, basically gave her a mechanism to say that, well, we don't have her medical history. It was destroyed in Katrina. And so you're just going to have to basically go by 
of what I tell you her history was. And what was her history? She had leukemia and she had all this kind of stuff. Well, what kind of leukemia? What was the specific diagnosis? Oh, I don't remember. Well, what was her treatments? I don't know. They put her on some kind of a treatment. Well, what specifically was the treatment? Well, I don't remember. And so it was very frustrating for the doctors to get to have to deal with her. So amidst all of that, Gypsy had a dad. And my impression of him, and, you know, I've, I've been practicing family law for a really long time. It's uh, my least favorite area of law. I had no desire to be a family law attorney. And yet, here I am 10 years later. But he was this guy that just kind of dipped out. And he says that he made efforts to see his daughter, him his, and his wife, said that we would call all the time. And uh, Didi would basically rebuff uh, their advances. Every attempt that he would make to try to have a relationship with Gypsy was uh, snuffed out by Didi. And unfortunately, I see that an awful lot. And most of the time, it's not because of Munchausen by proxy. It's not because of some mental deficiency. It's just simply because there's bad blood between the two. And Dominic, I don't know if you've ever been through a bad breakup or whatever. I don't know if you've ever had. And thank God if you haven't gotten married, I'd have to deal with all of that fallout. But when you break up with somebody and you don't have the baggage, you have all of the hatred and you don't have to talk to them anymore. When you have children together and you have a bad breakup, well, you still have to deal with them for the next 18 years. And it's hard for the dad or the mom, well, whoever the parent is that doesn't have custody of the child, it's difficult for them to try to maintain a relationship with the child if the custodial parent decides that you're not going to see them. You have to fight for them. And fighting takes a lot of energy. Fighting takes a lot of self-sacrifice. I'm not even sure if, it, if it's anything having to do with bravery, but it's difficult when the other parent, every time you try to make an, an, an advance towards your child, uh, decides that they're angry or it's just not, it's not happening today. You're not going to see your daughter. We're not going to give her that gift. You're not going to talk to her. We're busy. And they just kind of shut you down. I mean, in family law, it's not really a legal term. It's a term of art. But it's, it's basically parental alienation, where one parent decides that they are going to brainwash their child into making them believe that their father or their mother or the, the parent that they see the least doesn't want to have a relationship with them. And then it causes these bad feelings in the child, and then they're not trying to reach out to their father. And in the case of Gypsy, if you hear her tell it, that's kind of what she was told. Dad doesn't love us anymore, and so it's just you and me against the world. And then Gypsy would have all of these resentments that she would harbor towards her father. Um, and her dad just kind of, he just seemed, I, I don't know, but I get the impression from him that he just kind of gave up. He didn't really fight. He just kind of let things be. He didn't really make an effort to really get a handle on what her medical conditions were. He was told the same thing as everybody else. She's in a wheelchair. She's got a feeding tube, leukemia, and all of these things. I've seen fathers that if I know that they were told those things, they would stop. And they, they would, there was nothing that would stop them from getting to the bottom of what it was. Well, I want to know everything about the diagnosis. I want to see, make sure she's getting the best care. Look, you could hate me all you want. I'm here to protect my daughter or my son or whatever. But he was just resigned because Dee Dee was very, we just got done talking about Natalia Grace. You recall how we described how Christine was. She was like this basically uncaged beast wreaking havoc on whatever was in front of her. I don't get that impression from Dee Dee. I do get the impression, however, that she was just very probably exhausting to talk to. And I think that this guy just kind of just threw his hands up and said, oh, well, I tried. And uh, that was it. And he just let it be. And he had started a family and was just kind of monitoring Gypsy, I guess, throughout the years, but didn't really do anything to uh, stop it. I don't know what he knew. He knew that she was born in 1991, not in 1995. But one of the issues that came up with Gypsy was like she had three different birth certificates. and. 
she was literally, I think one of them said that she was born in 1995. I forget what the, yeah, the second one said, but she was being treated as if she was a child and she's literally 19 years old. I don't know how much of that her dad actually knew. Probably not much at all um, until everything came out after 2015 when the murder took place. But it was, I just, I just get the impression from him that he just kind of threw up his hands and said, well, is what it is. C'est la vie. And, and that was that. I'll tell you what. The doctors that handled this case, I have a really hard time understanding or believing the reasons that they gave for why they didn't alert CPS that, hey, this looks like a Munchausen case. One of the things that the doctor said, her pediatrician, number one, she had this pediatrician she went through and they were trying to find certain hallmarks of cancer and just something wasn't jiving right. That doesn't make any sense why this young girl can't walk. It doesn't make any sense why you're telling me that she has these things. We better send her to a neurologist. There was red flags there. The pediatrician comes, he came on in one of these documentaries and he said, and that, yeah, there was huge red flags there. It was very difficult to deal with Dee Dee. She was very hell bent in, in controlling the narrative. Whenever we would, we would challenge her, she would get upset. She would walk out. And then they would describe how she would interact with Gypsy. And there was this whole other layer of it going on, but it was odd. It wasn't out of the ordinary, but it was odd. But the fact that she was basically controlling Gypsy's medical history and telling the doctor that these things were diagnosed prior and them looking at the test and saying, it doesn't make sense. How could she have muscular dystrophy? This doesn't look like that. There, from what I'm seeing, there's no reason why this young girl shouldn't be able to walk. All right, well, let's send her to a neurologist. The pediatrician said that there was, there was red flags back then. All it takes for a doctor to refer somebody for a CPS investigation without getting in trouble is a reasonable suspicion that something nefarious is afoot. And he had a reasonable suspicion and he pawned it off to this neurologist who's been on many different documentaries talking about why he didn't decide to alert CPS when he suspected Munchausen. But her pediatrician decides, yeah, send it to the neurologist. And that was that. They send her to this neurologist and there's conflicting stories. The doctor says, Basically, that Gypsy stood up in her wheelchair and Dee Dee freaked out. Gypsy denies that that happened, but there was some, however it happened, whatever the truth is, and we'll get into all of the details about that. I just, I'm trying to share with you guys my candid thoughts because I, I really haven't wrapped my brain around this case and how I want to approach it. I'm still kind of trying to, to process it myself, but however it happened, it was determined that, okay, there's nothing wrong with Gypsy. She can walk. And the doctor says that I suspected it was a Munchausen case, but I couldn't prove it. And so I didn't report it to CPS. And then he gets on to this new Lifetime documentary where Gypsy is kind of recounting her, her tales. And he says, he's, he's, he's answered this question hundreds of times. And he basically says that, look, maybe I should have reported it and got a negative mark on my report card or something is, is kind of how we, I'm paraphrasing, of course. But he gives the wrong legal standard. You don't need to prove anything. It's not his job to prove stuff. Lawyers, um, attorneys, we go in there and we take the evidence and we try to make arguments one way or the other. We take the opinions of doctors. And of course, there's going to be conflicting opinions. Nobody's ever proving anything when we get a hold of the case. That's the job of the attorneys and the parties that want to advance whatever narrative it is. So this doctor just basically says, meh. I, I suspected Munchausen, but I couldn't prove it. And then he says something else like, well, what would have happened if I would have reported it? Then Dee Dee would have had some kind of story and just said that I was full of it or some kind of explanation. So yeah, well, that's kind of why we do investigations. But somebody should have looked into her medical history because there was nothing in her medical records that spoke to a specific diagnosis of leukemia. There was nothing in her medical records other than Dee Dee's accounting of what her ailments were, that she was ever diagnosed with MS. There was nothing that suggested that she needed to be in a wheelchair. 
I'm not even sure if there was medical records that suggested that she needed a feeding tube based on a legitimate medical diagnosis that didn't come from some story that was pawned off on the doctors by Dee Dee Blanchard herself. That is what you call a reasonable suspicion. If somebody is telling you that your child has leukemia or that this child that you're seeing has leukemia and you can't find any markers for leukemia and she can't articulate to you what the specific diagnosis was, then, you know, you have reason to believe that, you know, there's something else going on. And there was at least two doctors among the many that have come forward to speak to, yeah, there were red flags, but nobody did anything about it. And so here we are. And it gets to this point where, you know, Gypsy is getting older. You can only keep her in princess dresses. I've been watching Disney movies for so long before she was like 19 years old. And she decided that, you know, she wanted to not be held captive by her mother anymore. And so she starts talking to women online, or women online, men online. She had befriended, I forget where, but she had befriended a 36-year-old guy. I guess they had struck up an online relationship and Dee Dee had found out about it and was really, really upset. And when, he, when she found out about it, basically pulled a Gypsy into a room and started beating her up with hangers, the way the Gypsy describes it. I mean, calling her all of these, all of these names, you're a slut, you're a whore, you're never going to find anybody, you're never going to find love, you're never going to find happiness, and just berating her because she wanted to keep her confined in the house. Because in this relationship, Dee Dee was, if you could imagine, what's that movie, Dominic, the one where the mom is trying to keep the 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 daughter from the not rumple still skin thumbelina the one with the hair she has the hair and the guy climbs up rum puzzle uh, rum. <laughs> rum puzzle <laughs> rapunzel yes yeah it used to be my that used to be a raven's favorite movie how the mother's stealing her life force to look young and if she doesn't steal her life force, she turns into this uh, crazy old lady uh, like she resembled i think it was uh, like the snow white a witch they give her the apple but she would melt literally and so the only way she could stay young is by stealing the life force from her daughter that's pretty much what Dee, Dee was doing with gypsy she was satiating herself through perpetuating trauma onto gypsy and now uh, you know the chickens were kind of coming home to roost Dee, Dee is doing her thing gypsy is getting older she's getting this her own desire to talk to people that were not her mom she knew that she says she could all she always knew she could walk she always knew there wasn't you know all of these crazy things wrong with her but she started to start to put the pieces of the puzzle together she had found like some id card that had her real birth date on it saying that she was born actually in 1991 she wasn't 15 years old she was like 19 which would basically make her an adult and so she starts talking to people online and then well they didn't like it so, and, and you, you think, well, 36 year old guy, that's creepy. Yeah, that's kind of creepy for a 36 year old to be befriending a 19 year old, even if he, I mean, I don't know if he knew that she was 19 or not. I don't know if he told her, I feel like we got to get Chris Hansen on that case to, to catch a predator. I don't know what that guy was all about. He might've had bad intentions, maybe not, but there was nothing illegal there as far as I know, other than, unless you want to say that his intent was to groom a 15 year old girl into doing nefarious things i don't i don't know the truth of that or not but that leads to gypsy befriending nicholas go to john this young boy was autistic is autistic he's on the spectrum and if you know anything about autism there is a huge, almost infinitely large spectrum of autism that exists. My daughter has been diagnosed autistic. And I've had to learn, you know, a lot more than I ever cared to know about it prior to this. But my daughter, she was on the spectrum and she got diagnosed, I think, when she was like just short, just shy of her, her second birthday. And the way that they diagnosed her was because you're supposed to go and you, you take your child to all of these doctor's appointments. They test for... Uh, well, certain benchmarks. Is she walking? Is she gaining the appropriate amount of weight? You know, with respect to her age, is she talking? 
I mean, is she emoting? Is she putting together sentences? And if they start falling short of all of these other benchmarks, well, then they start uh, suspecting autism. And it was a lot of work to actually get her diagnosed with autism. But we went through, and not to bore you guys with all uh, of that, but she went, long story short, to all of these doctor visits. She ended up seeing a neurologist till finally through a number of different tests, they decided, yeah, she's not just autistic, but severely autistic, which was when I heard that for the first time, like, I don't know, I turned gray. My body went numb because in the course of taking her to these doctor's visits, you're around all of these other autistic children and you have the full spectrum of autism on full display in front of you. And these children, they run from severe autism where they're nonverbal, non-communicative, um, and they have all of these behavioral tics. Some of them get violent. Some of them harm themselves. And some of them, you know, just have severe lack of ability to have a normal life. And so you start thinking the worst. And my daughter at the time was not very verbal. She would very intensely focus on things and kind of just drift off in her own little world. And, and, and so there was all of these thoughts about what life held in store for her. And imagine me and my wife, we're, we're sitting there, we're trying to figure out what kind of life could we give her? What kind of life is she going to live? And just kind of hoping that we just hope for some semblance of normalcy. And we talked to this neurologist who basically says, yeah, she's, she's very clearly severely autistic, but you never really know how these things are going to play out developmentally. She might ex advance very quickly. Developmentally, she may, you know, stay at a certain level, but there's a really good chance that she might grow up and be in high school and live a perfectly normal, healthy high school life without any of she might basically grow out of her symptoms is what he was trying to tell us. And so we held out, we held out hope for that. And then at the time, you know, just behaviorally, she was getting kicked out of uh, preschools. Uh, she was biting other kids. But then my other daughter was doing the same thing and she was not diagnosed autistic. So we didn't know what was the result of her diagnosis or what was the result of her being uh, a normal kid. And we still kind of struggle uh, with that now. Like when she does certain things behaviorally, or where she says certain things. But I'll tell you what, the longer that she's been in school and the longer that she has, I mean, she's four years old now. And if you were to see her, if you were to, if, if you were to meet her, she's the sweetest little girl. You wouldn't, there was no reason why you would think that there was anything wrong with her. She talks perfectly normally. And she has these moments of clarity where it's like, wow, she's really paying attention to what was going on. Just the other day, she was fighting with her sister, Avalyn. And then I don't remember, I don't even know what they're fighting about, but they're in the backseat of my car. They're fighting over like a mermaid or something. And then Avalyn's like, Oli, you be quiet. And then Olivia's like, you're a dipshit. Avalyn's like, you're a pickle. And they were like, just, just normal kids, normal kids. And she got the dipshit one from her dad. I, I, you know, guilty as charged on that, but she picks up on those things. But the context and everything that she does, and I know I'm getting off track, but... She is autistic, but she, to my eye, you know, God willing, she is a high functioning autistic. And you know, what's funny about that? When you're going through those diagnoses, you take all of these tests and then they test the parents as well. I took a test to see if I am potentially autistic in some kind of like hereditary thing. I didn't score autistic, but I came pretty freaking close, like within a point. I was like, wait a minute. So am I autistic? And then I was joking with my wife. It's like, Hey, so if you get mad at me, you can't get mad at me for the things I say, because I have Asperger's. It would be like the big joke in the house. And I don't have any of those things. I'm not, I haven't been diagnosed with anything I suspect, but autism is a funny thing of all of the years that we've been studying it. we still don't know a whole lot about it other than to say that there's an infinite number of variables and it's very difficult to make heads or tails of it. So this young man, Nicholas Godijan, um, he was living at home with his parents and he had concocted this entire life and personality 
online. Which makes sense because, you know, if you're socially awkward and, you know, he's intensely focusing on things, it would be in places where he's most comfortable. So he creates this whole persona online. He goes on this Christian dating site and he had explained to Gypsy that he had multiple personalities. He was never diagnosed with that, but he says that there was a, a good Nicholas and a bad Nicholas. And the bad Nicholas, well, actually his name was Victor. And Victor was this 500-year-old vampire that told him to do sick and evil things. And a Gypsy, as they were in the course of their online courtship, would basically come up with her own personalities to match Nicholas's personalities. And she would come up with like different wigs and different clothes and outfits. So they're beginning this, this, this online relationship, and it just takes this very sinister turn at some point where they wanted to be together. And Gypsy had made an attempt to try to do this the right way. And they're like, okay, so I don't want to lie to my mom. I want this to work out. And if you hear Gypsy talk about it through various different interviews, just just sum it up. She, she had high hopes. Her plan was this. We'll go to the movies. And then we'll just bump into each other. We'll pretend like we're strangers. And that way you can meet me with my mom when she's there. And then that way it's not this thing that we have to hide. And then she'll see that you're this nice young man. And then maybe it'll be nice. That was her hope. But if he knew anything about Dee Dee, um, there was no chance in hell that was going to work out ever. But in Gypsy's naivete, uh, she wanted to take a crack at that. That was her plan. And they meet up at... This movie, Cinderella, the new Cinderella. Dominic, you know what that movie is about? I want to say that it took my daughter to see it. It was like, not the cartoon, but they try to make like a legit movie about it around that time, 2015. If you don't know, you have no reason to see that movie. If you didn't have a daughter. I've seen all of these movies because I have only daughters. And so I'm, I'm very versed, uh, well-versed in all of this stuff. But they go to this movie and... It just escalates really, really quickly. You know, most people on a first date, you know, it's like get to know you, coffee date, whatever, fine. But she was 19, and I forget how old Go John was. I think it was like 17 or 18. They're close in age, but oh, they couldn't control themselves. They go and escape to the bathroom, and they ended up having sex in the bathroom stall at the movie theaters. While she had, as she had went there with her mom, and being escorted in a wheelchair, as she goes to the bathroom and they do their thing, and then they come back, and then Dee Dee does meet a Nicholas. She thought it was weird. She thought it was strange. She didn't like him. And Gypsy is just kind of so devastated that it didn't work out the way that she wanted it to. And so at that point, and we'll get into all of the nitty gritty, all of the text messages, because there's a lot, but. Similar to how we did the uh, Natalia Grace case, I really just wanted to kind of sit and have a drink. And by the way, drink a choice this morning. Nicholas, I was, uh, Nicholas, Dominic, I was going to bring you some Templeton rye, but I forgot it on the counter at the house. So we are enjoying the last of the Woodford Reserve. And we're going to have a whole brand new lineup uh, coming out uh, next week, but. Yeah, so they, they go and they, they hatch this plan. And you hear them having these, these text messages and it basically amounts to, this is where it just kind of gets dark. Um, you you kind of hear and you could feel through their text, message, text messages that Gypsy of the two of them was the more developed emotionally. She was a lot smarter than a lot of people give her credit for. And she was certainly more intellectually advanced than Nicholas. And she would say these manipulative things that, you know, amount to, would you do anything for me? Uh, would you kill for me? Well, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to uh, get rid of my mom and then we're going to be together forever. And this was going to be like her Prince Charming coming to rescue her. This is the danger of raising a child on Disney. I'm guilty of this. Okay, so. My daughter, Raven, she's 17. She's uh, perfectly well-adjusted. She's doing really well. She's about to start college next year. She just started driving. She's doing all of these things. But 
when I was raising her, you know, I needed to fill the gaps. I needed to fill time as much as I can. I was in law school, you know, and in my, my, my time that I had with her, I had to find ways to fill the gaps. And so what would we do almost every weekend, every other weekend, uh, we had these passes to Disneyland and we'd go to Disneyland and she would see all the Disney movies. And uh, she was very much, she had a whole princess phase, a, you know, mermaid phase. And uh, she liked Rapunzel. That's her name, right? Rapunzel. I forget what that name, that the movie is called. I think it starts with a T, but she was in all of that. And she was very much raised in that Disney fantasy world about how, you know, you're this princess and someday your Prince Charming is going to come along. You're going to live ha happily ever after in a castle and, you know, such is life. But that is such an antiquated way of looking at the human condition as it exists in 24. We don't do that anymore. It's just not a thing. Unless you're growing up as part of the royal family, there's no monarchy here in America. I mean, even if you live in a place where there is a monarchy, you know, that applies to one family. If you're not part of them, you're going to go out, you're going to get a job, you're going to make something of yourself. But this idea that women are damsels in distress and they're just waiting for this strapping young lad to come and save them. Hey, there's some women that are still doing that, but the majority uh, go out and try to make their lives. And so it's antiquated. And I don't know if it's destructive or not, because, you know, there's still a role that fantasy and stories like that play in the childhood of young minds because it fosters imagination and gets you into developing your sense of how we verbalize and communicate with each other. And gender roles come from a lot of these things. And now you're starting to see a lot more of that open up. The storytelling has been exclusively man and woman. And now uh, Disney has made a concerted effort to kind of expand that. And so I don't really know where we're going with all of that, but this was Gypsy's world view. And so here she is, and she almost becomes predatory on Nicholas, where she, Nicholas is clearly head and shoulders um, in love with this girl. And you, you feel that when he's being interrogated by the police. And he's saying things like, I would, I would do anything for her. I worship her. And, you know, just saying all of this crazy stuff to the officer that's investigating him for murder. And just no sense of what's actually going on. When I look at people like that, it's, it's number one, the reason why you never, ever, ever, if you're suspected of a crime, talk to law enforcement without your attorney present because they're not going to talk to you. I'll tell you what happens. Hey, I want to talk to my lawyer. You know what happens? Questioning stops and it never starts up again. You want a question about this crime? You ask them on the stand. And, but they have this small window of time when the attorneys don't get involved. And you get to question uh, whoever it is. And this guy didn't know about what lawyers do or speaking to lawyers. He didn't even know that he was in danger. He's literally trying to profess his love to Gypsy as he's being interrogated by the, the investigators. And he admitted to the murder. Now in the trial, they tried their best to try to get rid of that confession. But not for the purposes of saying that he didn't murder them. It was for the purposes of basically stating that he lacks the mental capacity to form the intent required to commit first degree murder, which is what he was charged with. Um, that was their only defense. Nobody had, nobody had uh, denied the facts. It was one of those cases. And so um, he's, he's over there, he's being questioned. Um, and he just, he doesn't know he's playing the wrong game. He's not even playing the same sport, but that was the plan. So the plan was, they had concocted this plan and over text messages and uh, next week, we're going to go into all of those things. And we're going to detail what happened with the murder. But the plan was, she was going to help her boyfriend sneak into the house. She was going to let him in. Uh, she had purchased a knife from Walmart. And if you saw the murder weapon, it's like this jagged, it's not like a butcher's knife, but there's like a, it's like hollowed out in the middle and has these jagged edges it looked really, I don't know, like what it probably cost 15 bucks and not the ideal knife for carrying out a murder, but that's what she purchased for him. She hid the knife for him somewhere in the house. And then the plan was that she was going to go wait in the restroom. 
while everything was happening. And so Nicholas being duty bound by his love for Gypsy went on to carry out the plan. And he goes in and attacks Dee Dee. And the whole process took minutes. Whether it was two minutes, five minutes is unclear. But it was clearly not an instant kill. I mean, Dee Dee was suffering. She was scared. And you hear Gypsy say that I heard my mom crying out my name over and over again. That is corroborated by Nicholas saying that, yeah, she was crying out Gypsy's name. And that's when, look, for whatever Dee Dee did to Gypsy, for whatever torture she put her through, I'm not sure that she deserved to go out like that. And, you know, I'm not the arbiter of justice. I am not the one to pass judgments, but it just feels like she didn't deserve that. And, and she didn't, it doesn't feel like it. She did not deserve to be murdered that way. I mean, there's other punishments, whatever, sure. Yes, she ab abused Gypsy, but for her to go out that way, that just the fear that she must have felt, I don't even know if she recognized if it was a Nicholas, uh, the boy that she had met at the theaters. But she's crying out for Gypsy. That's who she's crying out for. And, and Dee Dee was at one point a young girl, same size as Gypsy. She had this relationship with her mom and her mom loved her and she loved being loved by her mom. And there's accounts where she would, everybody had their own rooms, but you know, Dee Dee liked to snuggle up to her mom in the same bed and then would sleep in the same bed and they would, and she'd be showered all these attention. But there was a point in her life where she was just an innocent girl. What she turned into, whatever you think it was, whether it was the product of her environment, whether it was a, the product of the way that she was raised, whether it was something else. I don't know. What she became was certainly not favorable, but who she was, a living, breathing human being, she didn't start off as evil Dee Dee Blanchard. And in that moment where her life was being ripped from her, where she was stabbed 17 times and her head was nearly severed uh, with this tiny little knife, if you catch a picture of it she didn't deserve that but that's what happened so gypsy is in the bathroom and as she is hearing her mother's screams she starts to have regrets but it's too late at that point i mean you've already started it i mean it's happening was she going to go from the come out of the bathroom to go save her mom no it was too late she was scared i imagine she was scared but if she did come out of the the the, the bathroom to save her mom would nicholas have stopped and listening to him talk i imagine she probably he probably would have i think he would have done anything that gypsy had asked him to do but she didn't and a short time after the murder began just as quickly as it started, just as quickly as it ended. And it was over. Gypsy, she basically said, I was too afraid to go. She tells the investigators, I was too afraid to go because I was afraid he was going to hurt me. And I don't know how much of that I believe. Because Gypsy starts, when she's being interrogated by the officers, she starts basically trying to pull the rug right out from, under, from Nicholas and place all the blame squarely on him. She manipulates him into committing the murder for her. Um, she manipulates him into taking the fall for it. Um, and in the moment she, when she's talking to the investigator, like I got I chills down my spine as she's, um, basically giving her account. Um, if you listen to, uh, if you listen to her jailhouse interview, not her jailhouse interview, the, the interrogation, I want you guys to go back as preparation for next week's show and just listen to her being interrogated. My takeaway from it is she's very calculating what she says. She's very clearly got a plan. She's very manipulative. And I think that she learned all of those things from her mom. She had a whole life um, of being trained on how to manipulate people by her mom. Um, and she really believed, she really believed, I think, that she was going to get out of this scot-free. All she had to do was turn on Nicholas. Oh, she turned on him so fast. But the reality of it was, I mean, she was going to jail. And ultimately, she did come in, in 2018 and give testimony, which basically was trying to 
help Nicholas um, because the whole defense was he lacked the intent to commit first degree. Maybe he should be guilty of second degree instead. And Gypsy was kind of basically giving testimony that supported, I guess, that story, that narrative. If you listen to Nicholas's account, he basically, I don't want to say it's heartbreaking to hear him say this. It's just, uh, it's, it's uh, very revealing to learn his mindset going through all of this. So he says, he thought he was going to get away with it. They had this strange plan that I still quite don't understand where the plan was. They were going to mail the murder weapon and the gloves that he used to commit the murders from Springfield back to his house at his parents' house uh, prior to them getting on the bus. And that was going to, I guess, somehow, uh, well, it was going to dispose of the murder weapons, but it's still, you're still sending it to you. I mean, most people would send it elsewhere, but he sends it to, well, his house. They had this pre-planned story for what to say if they got caught, which was abandoned right away. They asked him, did Gypsy know that you were going to kill her mother? And then he answered very honestly, said, honestly, she asked me to. She felt it was her only way to be with me. And I did actually stab her mom. That's what he says. Now, when he says he stabbed her, he says that he stabbed her four times. She was actually stabbed 17 times. Her head was nearly severed. I don't know how truthful Nicholas was being or trying to be. I don't know if he was trying his best to recall what he could remember. But, I mean, he immediately fessed up to what he did. And then he explains that Dee Dee had hollered for Gypsy and said, how does she holler? She, well, she pretty much yelped it. He used the word yelped. But it didn't stop me from keeping on going because he was there to carry out Gypsy's wishes. He was in love with her. So they began the cleanup where he says he asked Gypsy to clean up the murder scene naked. And then Gypsy wanted to have sex. And then they did. Um, if you hear Gypsy recall that story, she claims that she was uh, forced to go into her bedroom, lay on the bed, and then she was raped, uh, which I don't believe that for a hot country minute. But that's her story. He talks about the multiple people being in his head. He says, I originally had refused to do it. He said, my evil side is what actually did it. Victor. And he says, it's this character that he made up. 500 year old vampire who enjoys killing. He says, there's more than one person inside of me. Um, I used to take medication. I used to hear voices in my head. Um, and then, you know, he goes on that whole thing. But no, afterwards he says that me and Gypsy had cried multiple times. Uh, about what we did. And he says that this, I told Gypsy that this is forever going to haunt me for the rest of my life. And, you know, he's ultimately charged with first degree murder. They're, they're both charged with first degree murder. We never got to see the trial of Gypsy Rose because she pled guilty to second degree murder. Prosecutors thinking in that was probably she was going to, she was going to garner a lot of sympathy from the jury as the result of the utterly severe abuse that she underwent in the eyes of her mother. And Dominic, how tall are you? Like what, 6'2"? Yeah, 6'2". <sighs> All right. So you got to be six foot two, but if somebody were to stick a feeding tube into you, say at age four or five, and control your nutrients, so where they had free reign to control what you ate, they could starve you to look a little more sickly, I venture to guess that you might be like right now sitting there at five foot seven. She stunted her growth. She was not given an opportunity to, to become a full person or live a normal life and all of those things. She was severely abused. And the, the, the course of her life was necessarily altered by the abuse that was perpetrated on her by Dee Dee Blanchard. But... Okay, so since that whole narrative had already started to come out, the, the prosecution just kind of cut their losses and said, all right, you know what? Plead her to second degree murder. We'll give her the minimum, 10 years, and this is what she got open for parole. She recently just got par paroled out. She did about seven or eight years. Um, but Nicholas was a different case. So if you hear the prosecutor um, describe it, he says that the misconception 
The misconception was that he did this as an act of chivalry. In the prosecutor's mind, this wasn't a chivalrous act. This was something that he wanted to do. He had fostered feelings of wanting to kill. He had this whole alter personality, Victor, that he said liked killing. And so this was something he was going to do regardless of whether or not he ever met Gypsy Rose. And there might be some truth to that. If you look at the text messages, uh, some of them that we're going to go through, uh, there was text message on June 9th of 2015. The murder had occurred on June 10th, where he's basically saying, is your mom a light sleeper? And then he says, babe, this is my evil side doing it. And then he talks about his evil side is not going to mess this up because he enjoys killing. That's not somebody doing this out of, okay, I really don't want to, but I love you so much. I'm going to do anything to be with you. This wasn't that. This was something more sinister. The defense had argued, guy has a low IQ. He suffers cognitive disabilities. He wasn't able to formulate the requisite mens rea or mental state to commit murder in the first degree. But the juror, the, the jurors had seen the video of him in the investigator's room as he's being interrogated, basically stating he seemed like a normal person. He didn't seem like somebody that was cognitively impaired. I mean, he didn't, he wasn't talking like eloquently as if he was like Albert Einstein or something like that. But, it, you know, he seemed like he was getting along just fine. But they saw him admitting to the murders and he was communicating at a reasonable le uh, level. And one of the, the, explanations for that. Well, it was late and he was tired and he was just kind of saying whatever he had to do to get out of it. But then he gave another jailhouse interview that was recorded to a uh, TV reporter. He wasn't tired. It was like middle of the day. He hadn't been sitting there for hours. He wasn't arrested, going through his normal routine. And he admitted the same thing to the TV reporter. And so that defense was kind of just falling by the wayside. And indeed, the, juror, the jurors did not buy it. They convicted him of first degree. Gypsy gets on the stand, and we'll go into this in a lot more depth, but just the highlights. As she started talking about how her mother had forced her into a wheelchair, that she always knew that she didn't have to be in a wheelchair. She was just, her mom told her that she had cancer. She told her that she had muscular dystrophy. She did need glasses. She was told she needed hearing aids. Uh, hearing aids. She had a seizure disorder, and I honestly don't know if that was true or not. It seemed like she might have had seizures. I haven't seen anything corroborating, but we'll talk about more of that next week. She can't remember all the other stuff, but she started to piece everything together when she's about 19 years old. She didn't understand the full extent of what she had been through until she had been arrested. She admitted on the stand that she had purchased everything. She admitted that she got Nicholas to post the Facebook messages. And if you recall the Facebook messages, if you're familiar with the case, there was a, a Facebook post that basically said, I slashed... I slashed that pig and raped your sweet, innocent daughter. And then it's saying all of this nasty stuff. You guys could read that if you want. Maybe, maybe Dominic will post it. They asked her, why did you want to kill your mother? And what Gypsy said was, because I wanted to be free of her hold on me. And that was it. So, I don't know. Nicholas, you're a lay person. And I'm very curious. I have my own thoughts about what I think about how this turned out. Do you think 10 years is enough? Second degree murder is enough for Gypsy's role in everything that happened? No, I don't. Honestly, I think she deserves to get a little more um, just because, you know, she... She played a huge part in it. Without her, you know, Nick, uh, Nicholas wouldn't have done what he did. So I believe even though she went through the stuff she did, I feel like she deserved a little more time. Are you swayed by her uh, sickly appearance? And, you know, she looks like this little girl. I mean, does that does, does that grab you at all to give you more sympathy than you should? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I have daughters, you know, I'm a very susceptible to that. Matter of fact, I've been accused by other attorneys of being, you know, a, a little too emotional when it comes to these cases. When I have these uh, cases of child abuse and things like that, I literally had a case where uh, there was a father accused of uh, abusing his child. 
because he smacked this little girl in the face and pushed her head into a wall. And then the attorney comes to me and says, she didn't have any injuries. And I'm, I'm saying, hey, come here. I want you to look at this picture. You see this blood that's on the inside of her nose? That's not from an effing nosebleed. I asked him, Did, have you ever been punched in the face? And then he's like, well, no. It's like, well, that's kind of one, that's, that's kind of what happens. You get these, these little micro abrasions on the inside of your nose. And not only that, she was accused of being, uh, her face pushed into the wall and a lot of other things. But he was very upset with me because um, I wouldn't dismiss the case because of lack of injuries. Like, we're not dismissing anything. Like, you think your client's innocent? I have my suspicions. We're going to litigate this all the way through. I'm not just going to dismiss it because you don't know what it's like to get punched in the face or, you know, whatever your opinions. You could argue that. More than welcome to argue that. But I've been accused of being, you know, manipulated by the appearance of children or just simply the, which is probably true. Everybody's manipulated emotionally at, at some point by that. But, you know, there's attorneys that are hypersensitive to it. There's, a, there's attorneys that are psychopaths that are not affected by it at all. I happen to be the latter. And, you know, I don't apologize for that. It is what it is. But like I said, I'm not, I don't get emotional about it. I, I'm in a search for truth. If she wasn't abused, I want that to come out too. And, and so in the case of Gypsy, I mean, I look at her sickliness, but for me, what suspends that for me is just the text message between the two, her manipulation of it. But then I don't know how much I should even put into that because if you hear Nicholas going back with her, and I don't know if he's playing the role of Victor because, you know, he thinks it's like Dungeons and Dragons or something or whatever online game that they're playing. It's real life. But he did commit the murder. I don't know if, I don't know. It's a lot different shooting somebody in the face in Call of Duty and actually having to do it with a real life gun. You know, you could play Dungeon, Dungeon Dragons all you want with uh, knives online and, you know, whatever. But the act of nearly decapitating a grown woman as she screams the name of her daughter in fear is a level further than what I believe I'm capable of. Unless in the defense of my own daughters, then, you know, all bets are off. But I don't know. If you ask my opinion, this is one of the rare cases where I feel like the sentencing of Gypsy Rose for her to get 10 years, I think was probably fair. As much as her role was in manipulating Nicholas and all, she didn't commit the murders. And it was like, I don't know if you're familiar with the show Breaking Bad. You ever saw that show with the, the, the Salamancas and all of that? There's this really famous scene. I mean, they're all famous, but there's this scene where in one of the shows where they have the two, you remember the crazy uh, hitman brothers? They're playing in the yard. And then the guy's like, uh, he broke his toy. And then he says, I hate my brother. I wish he was dead. And then, Mark Margolis, rest in peace. He just recently passed away. Um, he tells him, hey, come here. He, goes, he, he gets his brother and then he grabs him by the neck and he plunges his face down into this ice bucket that was holding his alcoholic beverages. I mean, he's holding him there and the other brother that said he hates him, is, is he just flipped. Now he's trying to save his brother and he's hitting him and he's hitting him and finally he gets up. And then at the end of it, Grandpa Salamanca gets up and says, Familia es todo. I know my Spanish sucks, but <laughs> Ileana will grade me on that next week. But he said, family is everything. But it was, it was almost akin to that, where like she wanted, she in the moment, that's what she thought she wanted. But in the moment, she wanted to uh, flip and reverse, but she was, you know, not the kind of person that was physically able to do that, or she just wouldn't. I don't know, but... Again, I have not fully formed all of my thoughts. I'm rattled by this case because I have, I almost, it's one of those rare cases where I literally have sympathy for all of the main players in this case. I sympathize with Didi to a very large extent. I sympathize with Gypsy, uh, Gypsy obviously, uh, but I have some sympathy for Nicholas too. And I'm not really sure where I'm going to fall on all of this, but we're going to dive into all of this and next week in depth, next week, we are going to go further in depth about the extent of the abuse that Gypsy underwent. And then after that, we're going to recap the dynamics of the trial and how that all came to be and where everybody's all doing now. Uh, but that's going to be next week. But for now, 
this was our introduction, our primer to the, our next series, which is going to be on Gypsy Rose. We're going to cover that. Uh, but that's all I really have for you guys this week. And uh, I'm really looking forward to getting into it. If you want to prep for the show, there's a number of different documentaries that are out there. The, the most recent one just came out on Lifetime. There was a, a another one in 2017 and on 8 and 18 that had come out um, that also talks about the case. But I'm going to really get into um, some of the finer details and just see what was what. I think we need to know the extent of what Gypsy went through, what's fact and what's fiction. Gypsy has a story. Not all of it is true. I can tell you that right off the bat. Um, to what extent was she abused? I think that's very important to know. And by the way, since she, when she was recalling her years in prison, by all accounts, it was like she was at summer camp. She was doing well. She learned to do her makeup. She was finally free of her mother. She was starting to develop the way a normal person would. She went to school. She educated herself. She has her high school diploma now, I think. She has all these plans. She put on weights. She looks healthy, actually. I don't, she must have weighed not, not much more than 85 pounds when she was arrested. She's probably a really good, healthy weight now. She looks really good from what she was when she went in to now. By all accounts, she's thriving. And she's out now. Nicholas is still in jail. We're going to talk about whether or not that's fair. And we're going to further develop our thoughts on that. And I invite all of you uh, to join us next week when we uh, talk about those things. And with that, I thank you guys for joining us for this episode 56 of the Tilted Lawyer podcast. We're going to see you guys all next week. Bye-bye. All right. With that, I have some divorce advice for all of you. And you know what? I think we need to bring in Purple Rain. We're going to, we're going to transition to Purple Rain because we're going to have a talk with Uncle Omar about uh, divorce advice. Uh, there's a young lady that is wondering about whether or not she should get advice. This young lady is 28 years old. Here's what she says. I have been married to my husband, who's 32 years old, for almost six years now. I love my husband, but lately I have been contemplating telling him I would like a divorce. We welcomed our first child in September of 2022. That's rough. So it's an incredibly difficult decision for me. We have done couples counseling in the past, and I've encouraged him to talk with the therapist after the baby arrived, and he started having the jealous feelings, that, but he never followed through. We had a big blowout fight, or we have a big blowout fight at least once a week, and no matter how much I express, I feel like I am not being heard. It never results in an actual resolution. When our first son arrived, my husband dealt with some jealousy issues and having to share me with the baby. Those are his words. We have never really been the same. And all this constant fighting really has me debating on if we should call it quits for the betterment of our son. But I truly do not know if having divorced parents is better than having parents that fight a lot. I just want to make the best of shit decision for him. All right. These are my candid thoughts. I don't know, Dominic. What would you tell this lady just off the basis of the strength of what she just said in your 25-year-old life perspective? Based on what she's saying there, what do you think that I'm going to say? Yay or nay to this? Nay. <laughs> you think that I'm going to tell them they should stay together? Oh, no, no, no. You should uh, definitely leave. <laughs> <laughs> well let's just let's let, let's get this started if you want to get divorced you guys have been married for six years now all right so that means you were 22 he was 26 when you guys got married you were just a baby when this happened but you guys have a child together and look six years in you guys have committed this much of your life together but you're not going anywhere you have this child and what? You're going to get divorced. You're going to be a single mom. You're going to get divorced, and he's going to be a single dad. And you're going to have to figure out the custody and visitation of it all. Likely, it sounds like that's probably going to be you because you're telling me that, you know, he's jealous of the baby and all. But, hey, that's a very real discussion that has to be had. Custody and visitation. What's it going to look like? What is the visitation going to be? Is it going to be every other weekend? Are you guys going to do a 50-50 thing? What about alimony? We're going to talk about child support. We're going to talk about uh, spousal support, which you're not, you're probably not going to get much of 
uh, since you guys are in in married well in California. In California, if you haven't been long, married longer than ten years, there's a, there is a presumption that if you're going to get alimony at all, it's going to be for presumably half the length of the marriage. You're going to have a few years of that. Look, getting divorced is a really difficult thing to do. It's permanent. But it is difficult. You got to go through financial disclosures. You got to go through, we got to have these talks about support. We got to have these talks about custody and visitation. How are we going to divide up the assets? It is not a lightweight thing. And you know what? It's a lot harder going through all of that when you have basically a one year old uh, toddler growing up in your house. And so I'm not saying that you should or that you shouldn't. I'm just saying that is a very big decision. I'm glad that you're asking me about it because it, um, you know, it's something that you should consider, but she consent continues. This is what she says. Um, Today we argued and I told him why something he did was bothering me. Instead of trying to hear where I'm coming from and see my perspective, he gaslights me and deflects like his life depends on it. This is the outcome I expect to the point where I just totally avoid talking and about things that bother me. I know that this is not healthy, but mentally, this is where I'm at. You can only be told your feelings are invalid and crazy so many times before you start to think that might be true. Well, you know, uh, to be honest with you, it sounds like the relationship is on the outs. Any man that gets jealous of his wife taking care of their son is a red flag. But I'll tell you what, it's not uncommon. You know, it's a very common thing. So here you have, you guys are, are in this relationship and for all of this time, and you guys were together for six years and who knows how long you're together before that. Now, all of a sudden, here comes this, this baby that's stealing all of your time. You don't have time to be intimate. You don't have time to go on dates. Uh, you probably uh, don't even have time to get dressed up and, and, and put on your makeup the way that you normally would. Uh, because, hey, it's a 24-hour job to do this uh, this baby thing. And the truth is that if you're dealing with the brunt of it, which it sounds like you probably are, and he's over here telling you that your feelings, and I, I can only imagine what your feelings were, but I imagine that you're feeling underappreciated. You're feeling like you're doing this all by yourself. You're probably feeling exhausted. Uh, you feel like you're you know, living in this weird baby world and you just kind of have this desire to be an adult sometimes. And, you know, you're trying to do your best to take care of your son. And here's this guy um, worried about his own selfish needs. It's the danger of having a child when you're married. It changes up the whole dynamic, man. Um, intimacy is less. You guys are going to look worse. Just necessarily, you're going to look worse. When you were 22 years old, you were this young, um, hot, vibrant, attractive young woman and you've given this man your best years and him was probably the same he's the, the same guy but now you've had this baby and your body has transformed into something that you're not used to um and he's having to deal with that and he's well not him you are having to deal with that and so your your insecurities are probably through the roof and what you require to basically counterbalance that is you need some things from him. And what you don't need from him is him telling you about how he feels slighted because you are breastfeeding the child as opposed to doing whatever you're going to do with him. It's understandable why you would want to get divorced. I guess you guys mentioned you've been through counseling. You can only go through counseling so far. But I could just tell you this. Most men, the counseling is very simple. We don't have, men, most men, don't have a strong desire to talk about feelings. We don't have a strong desire to try to understand what you're going through. And most of the time, especially if he's trying to do all of this gaslighting stuff and make you feel guilty for taking care of your son, he doesn't have a large capacity to show you empathy. And you're going to go through this for a very long time. And what's more is he's 28 years old. No, he's not 28 years old. He's 32 years old. And he's old enough to know better. If you think it's going to get any better uh, from this point out, it's probably not. And I hesitate to say that because I would love 
to be able to tell you that, oh yeah, no, this is gonna be fine. It's perfectly normal to go through this gaslighting phase. It's perfectly normal for him to feel guilt or not guilt, jealousy over the attention that you're giving to your son. Those are normal things, but I'll tell you what, most well-adjusted men that are in that position recognize what you're going through, even if they're not able to voice their support for you, even if they're not able to articulate how they feel about you or, or feel or tell you that they appreciate you and all of these things. We have our certain ways about how we do it, you know, through our actions. Look, men, the good relationships that I've seen with my clients, and mind you, when I when when people come to me, they're usually at the point where you're at. Should I get a divorce? Should I not? And it just, you know, it's it's a difficult decision to make. But I'll tell you what, the odds that he's going to all of a sudden change overnight and start acknowledging and appreciating you in a way that you want to be appreciated is slim to none. I guess the question really is, like, what if he, what, what is it that he could possibly do that could make you feel better? Because that is not an easy answer. You got to be realistic with yourself. Like, what is it that he could, what, okay, let's just say in a perfect world, he recognizes you and he acknowledges how much you're going through. And he starts telling you about how you're never mind about whatever your body's going through. You're still beautiful to me and all of these things. And he starts respecting the awesome job that you have as a mother and the breastfeeding and the bonds and, and changing diapers and all of this stuff. Um, and saying, you know, what? don't worry about our time. We'll find our time. You take care of our son. Um, and I'm going to go out and I'm going to go out uh, and gather the resources and conquer and make sure that we have everything that we need. If he does all of those things, do you think it's going to fix everything? Because I'll tell you what, the funny thing about having toddlers is that the number of social anxieties, the number of relationship insecurities, and the way that you feel and how bad that you feel is infinite. You fix one problem and another one pops up. Next thing you know, you're feeling neglected. Next thing you know, he's already feeling neglected. And, and then, you know, that snowballs into whatever it's going to snowball into. But if he's being selfish with his time, if he's being selfish with his feelings, if he's not giving you anything in back, you really have to ask yourself very carefully, is that what's really going on? Because if the answer is yes, if he doesn't give a shit about you, if he doesn't care about what you're going through, if he doesn't even acknowledge, you know, how hard it is, your daily schedule. I remember what it's like. Every two hours that baby wakes up, hopefully your baby's sleeping through the night, but the feeding schedule, um, the constant crying, it's a 24 hour job to look after and care for a child. It changes the, di the dynamic. 100% it does because you have now sacrificed yourself uh, for this child. You have to keep it alive. You got to keep it happy. You got to do all of these things. And so, yeah, that's going to, that's going to cause a lot of conflict, but I want you to be honest with what you're saying, what you're saying to me, because the way that you have described him is like, he sounds like the devil. He does not acknowledge your plight as a woman. He does not, he not acknowledge that uh, you are now the mother of a child. He is not playing a role in rearing or raising the child or not doing his part. He just wants you to spend time with him and, and do his bidding. If that's truly what it is and you're not embellishing, that sounds like a like a bad guy. And if that's truly what he's doing, is he going to get better? No, no, he's 32. He's 32 years old. Matter of fact, it's probably going to get worse because you know what happens with the men when they're 32 years old? They start physically degrading. It's really hard. Look, I'm 43. I remember how I looked when I was 27. I don't look like that anymore. Hey, Dominic, in 10 years, you're not going to look like that anymore. It's going to be something completely different. You can, but there's a whole regimen. There's a, You got to take care of yourself and be healthy and go to the gym and do all this kind of stuff. You have to, it's just a different thing with men. Men have their own insecurities. And right now, I can tell you that what that man might be feeling, he might be feeling insecure himself. He might be getting a little bit of a belly. 
He might be losing some of his muscle mass. He might have put on some pounds. He might be feeling because you are no longer paying as much attention to him. Neglected and start equating that, as he always has, is when my wife really feels attracted to me, she tells me and does certain things. And now all of those things have gone away. So, of course, even if he was the most well-adjusted of men, he's going to feel neglected to a degree. Is that really jealousy or sin? Well, you said that it's what he said. But is that really something else? Is he maybe also feeling insecure himself? You mentioned you guys have gone to therapy. Maybe you guys have talked about this kind of stuff. Maybe you haven't. I'm just going to say, if there is any benefit whatsoever to keeping your family together, because you think that maybe this, A, this is a secret. Between you and me, when your baby is less than two years old, it's hard. When your baby hits about three, four years old, it gets worse. I mean, it gets better because, you know, the potty training and all that kind of stuff, but you just come up with these new problems, behavioral issues, their energy increases, they get louder, they get more opinionated. It gets easier in terms of sleep schedule, but the duties do not change. It's still going to be hard. And hey, until they start going to school, maybe until they're about five, six, seven years old. This is a lifelong thing. You guys are either going to adjust to it or you're not. And if you think that it's impossible that you guys have, that you have no ability to make these adjustments and it's going to continue to degrade this way, then maybe the move is divorce. Is it better off for a child to grow up with divorced parents as opposed to parents that are always arguing? Yeah, it is. Because, matter of fact, there is a lot of what happens in homes, the screaming and the shouting and a lot, of, a lot of things that happen are tantamount to domestic violence. And if you ask what the law says about it, what the law says is that, at least in the state of California, any parent that commits an act of domestic violence against the other parent in front of the child is presumed that they should never have custody or visitation of the child until they overcome that presumption. And they could do that by doing certain things to better themselves. The statute outlines like six different ways you could do that. Beside the point, it's not healthy for a child to grow up with parents that are constantly fighting. But if you don't have an ability to argue with your spouse outside of the vision or ears of your child, you better develop that skill very quickly if you guys are screaming and shouting at each other stop that shit why there's no reason why you guys have to raise your voice at each other if you get that angry where you're where you're shouting at your spouse that's stuff that you did when you're on the schoolyard and schoolyard fights that's stuff that you did when you're a teenager if that carries into your adult years and it doesn't stop by the time you hit your 30s 40s well then you just that's what it is that's what it's going to be but it's not healthy and no child should have to put up with that. And if you don't think you could do it without, uh, be with him without that happening, then maybe divorce is the best option. But if you carry that into your next relationship, it's not going to get any better. And I'll tell you what you're looking at. Being a step parent sucks. Your value as a woman at 22 is not going to be the same as a divorce, a single mother of a child at 29 who has undergone uh, the perils and the destruction of what a pregnancy does to a woman's body. It's just going to feel different. And so you're going to be different. You might meet somebody and your uh, communicative ab abilities with this other man, that she, this, this new guy or whatever, maybe it gets better. Maybe it gets worse. There's no guarantee. You're gambling with your future. I paint a dark picture because you're in a tough spot. If you don't get divorced, the danger is you're going to wake up tomorrow and you're going to be 40 years old. And you're going to have a, a bad marriage and a child that's been exposed to all of the shouting and fighting and who knows how far that escalates. But at that time, you can't get that time back. If you choose to cut ties now, fine, do it. But you better go, if you're going to do that, have a clear plan. Look, divorce is not easy. Sometimes it is, 
but not with the kid. You could, you could easily resolve all the other issues, but resolving issues of child and custody is a difficult prospect, no matter how good the circumstances are. Even if you guys are in full agreement, you know, somebody, what if somebody wants to move to Texas? What if somebody wants to, you know, do whatever? You are bound to this person for the duration of that child's life. And, you know, you don't get to pick and choose. It's, it's, that's it. When you decide to remarry or get in another relationship, that person is going to be affected by your old relationship. That makes it less palatable. It makes your options fewer. Maybe you can do it. Maybe you can't. Maybe it works out or maybe it doesn't. I'm just going to say this. If there is a way to salvage what you have, then do it. But if you know, and you're not on here on Reddit embellishing how bad it is, and if he's truly this evil person the way that you've made him out to be, then yeah, maybe it's best to cut ties. But if you think that maybe you're overstating things, give him the benefit of the doubt. But if it continues, then maybe you're right. I guess the question just, it, it, the question lies in what is his ability to adjust? What is your ability to adjust? It's not just an adjustment for him. It's an adjustment for you. Where you guys might've been having sex every day. That might turn into like sex every week, every other week, every month, every, twice a year. I've heard all the horror stories. If that's your way of communicating and bonding with your partner and you don't have alternate means, then yeah, your part, your relationship is going to suffer. And it's, it's unfair of me to try to diagnose this without hearing from this guy firsthand and knowing what his experiences are. I'm, I'm really getting this from you. But you know when you're heart of hearts about, you know, what's really or actually going on. I'm just, I'm just going to say this. If he is really not making any effort whatsoever to see your perspective, and he's feeling, you know, jealous of your son, make at the very least an effort to find out why that is. Is it his insecurities? Maybe you guys should have that discussion. Is it because you guys are having sex less? Is it because he thinks he's 32 years old now and this isn't working out? Is it all downhill from here? That's a very real thought that real married folks go through when you have a child. Look, you're only single without kids and responsibilities for a short time in life. Once you have that first child, everything shifts. It's a very difficult psychological transition to make man or woman. The issues are different. There's some issues that are common, but if you can't make the adjustment together and you have no ability to do that, then maybe it's time to cut ties. But do not do that before at the very least giving him the benefit of the doubt and seeing where this transitions um, while the baby is young, two, three years old, this might all, he might grow out of it. He might learn how to be a dad. Right now, he's learning how to be a dad. Right now, you're learning how to be a mom. You might even have a better grip on it than he does. But more importantly, he's having to learn on the fly how to be a husband to you with the birth of your son. And you also have to learn how to be a wife to him with the existence of your son. It's a, variable, it's a variable that has changed and you can't change it now. There's no going back. So it is what it is. And that is what you, that, that's what you sign up for, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, through the changing of the seasons, through the passage of time, no matter how good it is, no matter how bad it is, you chose this man. You chose him when you were young. I wouldn't have advised you to do that, but you did. And you chose to take him on with all of his... Uh, all the worst of the worst, all of his snakes, all of his demons, all of everything. He chose that. If you don't make an attempt to embrace it, then you're doing yourself a disservice and you're possibly doing your son a disservice. You never know. In a couple of years, it might work out. It might. Because if what he's going through is a maturity issue, there's no fixing that. But if it's a transition issue, well, that's temporary. And, you know, he might wake up at 35 years old and just completely figure it out. It's going to take him a little while. His whole life has changed. There's, it's just, everything is different when you have a child. And so give it a little bit of time. There's no reason for you to get a divorce right now unless you are unsafe. If it's just you're feeling a certain way because, you know, your feelings, that's one thing. If it's your safety, that's quite another. Then run for the hills. Just give it some time. 
wait and give it a year. You might be surprised at how much you guys learn how to be married with a child. It might work out. Counseling doesn't solve everything. And people, I feel like they rely on that so too much as a crutch. Most men are not receptive or going to be receptive to marriage counseling because it's this awkward thing. This person is telling you about how you're supposed to be a man and how you're supposed to be attentive to your wife and her emotions and all of this stuff. And, you know, the act of even getting becoming receptive to that is an act of what's in and of itself. But you guys have been together. So look, you guys are partners. Try to figure it out on your own. There is a line that you should set for yourself. This is the deadline. This is the cutoff. There's a, I'm willing to put up with this, but I'm not willing to put up with that. And you guys are already talking about this. And honestly, you should be having this conversation with him that look, that I feel like this is where we're going. If we don't change something, this is what's going to happen. And so you need to know that I'm your wife and I'm raising your son. And I want to make sure that you feel appreciated and attentive, but also I have needs too. He may or may not be receptive to that. You've already told me that he's not receptive to that, but give it a chance. Let him make the adjustment. If the adjustment doesn't come, then there's nothing wrong with cutting ties early. Your son will survive. Is it better or worse to have a broken home versus an intact home? I don't know. I, I really don't. In, in a good marriage, if the marriage is good, of course, that's, that's better. That's what everybody has. But guess what? What's the percentage of the world's population that you think has that? Very small. Your child is resilient. He'll adjust. So in the meantime, don't cut the ties right now. Give it a little bit. See where it goes. See how he matures. See how this new child and the changes that you guys both have to make, see where it lands and then make the decision then. But if no change and whatever the gaslighting continues without acknowledgement of the awesome sacrifice that you've made for the family, that's not going to get better. Then you want to cut the ties. A little premature, but yeah, you guys are heading that way. Just let's see how it develops and then we'll see. But that's all, that's all I have for you guys on this issue of the Purple Haze Reddit advice, relationship and divorce advice from family law attorney Omar Serrato. We're missing Ileana Rosa today because she's taking care of her very sick child. It's, it's a rainy day in Southern California. Everybody's getting the flu. I've been able to avoid it thus long, this thus far, um, you know, luckily, but we'll see. But that's all I have for you guys for this week. We will see you guys on the next episode. I love you guys all. We'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.